And uh, let me start that over. I kind of I meant to say indie developer first and <laughs> what an idiot. I just got tripped over my own words. Sorry That's about right. that. That's okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pursuing Pixels. My name is Kevin Portelli, and I'm here tonight joined again with our pal and uh, indie designer and indie developer, uh, Matt Glanville. How you doing tonight, Matt? Hello. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good deal. Thanks for uh, joining us again two weeks in a row. We don't have to let anybody know that we recorded these back to back. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're <laughs> super glad to have you. But, like we obviously, you know, we've gushed about your games, like I mentioned last week, uh, numerous times on the podcast. And we're always like, you're always even popping into our discord and like even like DMing me sometimes like check this game out. This one looks up your alley. So like you're, you're always kind of in tune with the type of games we like to play and check out or at least speaking for myself for sure. Like we're on the same wavelength. So I've yeah. been really looking forward to chatting and like picking your brain about your actual process about like the games that you work on and especially being as like your first three games, which again, we've talked about on the podcast a few times or at least mentioned uh, switch and shoot. Ghost Grab 3000 and Singled Out are all like they have a very arcadey like pick up and play really short burst sessions like you know it's it's like here's the gameplay concept and here's what it is love it or hate it like this is what this is what it is play yeah. the game and that that is what it is where your game that you're working on currently Dungeon Death Ball which is uh, I think the first time I think I mentioned last week too that you've done kind of an early access thing and it it still has like a lot of that arcadey DNA in my opinion um but it it definitely is got way more depth than your other games and that's not a slight on the other games but it's just this is clearly you know, a replayable thing. Like I mentioned last week, DJ's already been playing it like again and again and again, even though he's beaten it, he's, he's like the type of person that a lot of times will beat a game. And like that, as long as he saw credits or like, or technically beat the game, like that's good enough for him. And he's on to the next game. So it's something for, to be said, if he's like, I want to max out, I want to like keep perfecting my runs. Like it's not every game that makes you want to keep doing that. You know, it's not just because you can, that you want to, you know, so yeah. I, I'm just very curious, like how, how has that process gone for you in switching gears a little bit, at least in my mind, or, or has it not felt so much like a gear switch for you uh, um, moving into working on dungeon death ball? Yeah, not really, because I mean, when I, when I started it, um, so I, I actually made, uh, I, I kind of worked on these games in a weird order. So I made switch and shoot. And then I, um, when I went full time indie, um, Dungeon Death Ball was the first project that I started almost immediately. Really? Yeah. And that was wow. like three and a half years ago now. Wow. Um, and, and in that time, I kind of took a, a bit of a break from it and, and made Dungeon, sorry, it made Ghost Grab 3000. Um, and then <laughs> actually during Ghost Grab 3000, I took a break as well and made Singled Out. So, <laughs> I like. <laughs> I kind of went down like an Inception style, like into multiple projects, and now I'm like working my way back out. And I suppose at some yeah, point, it's almost like if, yeah, I'll it's find out like if nesting, like, yeah, yeah, nesting dolls or something. Yeah, yeah, I'll find out if like actually I I am in a game as well. That's like the next logical step. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so like at the time, it didn't really feel like kind of switching gears from a, a pattern I'd established. It was it was more just like okay, what's the next project? And and also, um, Dungeon Death Ball started out as something much much smaller, um, as is like the case with. So every many. game yeah yeah <laughs> um which has been like a real pain to kind of resolve actually um but but yeah like it, it started out as a prototype which um um you were mentioning just now like the 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 uh, patreon prototypes i got on my on my itch page um one of those called confused rogue um was actually like the seed for dungeon death ball so it was like a a, a 1d roguelike where you're just moving left to right and you get okay. a random selection of actions that you can perform. Um, and it's kind of like a slot machine. So like when you use what you have like three, basically like a, like a deck builder sort of thing, but you have like three okay. actions at the bottom. When you use one of them, it'll be randomly replaced with another one. And you just have to like pick from those three of how to, how to progress. And it's just like pushing left to right through like oncoming waves of enemies. Um, and, 
I, I started to build up into a bigger game. And like, as I did that, it kind of evolved into this like 2d rather than 3d, uh, sorry, 1d, um, 2d, like actual, like tactics game basically. Um, and then also yeah. like with this whole sports element. So like all of that grew out of it. Um, originally it was going to be like quite, a, quite a tiny game. Um, yeah, it just got way out of hand. <laughs> it, in in a good way though because like you can tell that you've been honing these ideas for a while and again i like i the only reason i hadn't played it up up until pretty recently till you reached out and were like hey you guys want to check it out i want to make this like final layer of polish and like because i i always just kind of i have a, this like mental barrier with early access games where i'm just like i want to play it when it's when the developer feels like it's ready you know but yeah. at the same time yeah, I do understand like, hey, you want some feedback, especially for a game like this, where it is like it isn't just like an arcadey thing that's that is based on kind of control and gameplay feel. It really is like, how do these mechanics marry together with one another? And how, do, you know, does this kind of does this make things too easy? Does this make things too hard? Is this well balanced? Like it you get into a lot more when you're when you're getting into the tactics aspect of yeah. things, I would feel, you know, every everything you add is going to change maybe five other things in the game and the way they work. Yeah. Um, it's a real balance. So I, I got to imagine it. Yeah. Like I, I got to imagine every update you make, you're like, or you think of something like, Oh, I want to put this in the game. And then it's like, Oh, but if I do that, then I got to worry about how this enemy works. Cause that might be too easy for them to exploit that mechanic or something, you know? Yeah. Whereas like switch and shoot, it's just like, you can probably just say again, not to say that this is easy, but you can just say like, okay, how does the difficulty curve feel? And that's kind of what you're balancing mostly, you know, and, and style and, and all the other stuff. But you're not having to think about, like, does this weapon is this weapon too powerful? Is it you know, you're not having to juggle all that extra stuff, which is I, I don't know. I, I wonder how what do you prefer as far as like game designing or do you kind of like to have these multiple projects going on at once and like hmm. be like, oh, OK, I'm kind of burned out on Dungeon Death Ball. So let me get a little let me work on singled out or let me join uh, a game jam for I know singled out started as a game jam project in the, mm -hmm. the game makers toolkit uh, game jam, which we've talked about a few times on the podcast. And I know you've participated in a, a couple times as well. Yeah, I do. I do love doing that. But I think it's like I need to. One thing I've learned over the last few years of doing this like indie full time work is that like I need to really kind of um, rein myself in sometimes because I do just it's so easy just to get completely sidetracked and like go, OK, I'm just going to build up this like prototype idea over over the weekend. And then like the next thing I know, I've spent a week building that up and have not touched my main project, you know, and I'm right. sure lots of other people have the same issue. And like this is why projects just kind of get you know left abandoned is because like by the time it's by the time you think you should come back to the one you started ages ago it's like you've lost interest or, or you're like you don't understand your code base anymore or you've improved so much you don't want to work on that anymore and right like, right this has really been like an experience for me to learn um how, how to discipline myself and and just like absolutely like stay focused on this one thing um you, you must finish it like don't get sidetracked anymore like i, I did it twice that's yeah. enough right like <laughs> yeah stop it now but at, least with, <laughs> at least with some of those sidetracks you were able to turn those into released games you know with ghost yeah. grab 3000 and and turning singled out from a game jam entry to and i don't think you'd even change that much with singled out right i know you added yeah. some like more more randomization and like leaderboards and you know some more cool features but it's virtually the same game right uh, yes. between the game jam version and the version that's on switch and steam yeah i kind of i kind of amazed myself in in doing that and i think like this is the the beauty of game jams is that you you can amaze yourself with like how much you can get done in in a short time when you really have to focus it and like control the scope whereas with yeah um like ghost grab 3000 and dungeon death Ball, they they both really like grew and evolved so much throughout development um, that they're almost, I mean, not unrecognizable, but, but they are drastically different games from how they started out. Whereas yeah, singled out was like yeah, basically the same game that I'd released as part of the game jam in a 48 hour window. Just, yeah. yeah like you which said, is like crazy bulked up basically bulked up and polished. 
Yeah. And it, it's so good. That's like the perfect type of game. Like I know we were talking about last week, like this is a different type of game, but like, uh, you know, I was talking about how I like to play like puzzly games on like couch co-op style, even if somebody doesn't have the controller, but this is a perfect, like if you got some buddies over like having a few beers or whatever and like passing the switch around or the controller and like, it's just kind of, it's such a wacky, goofy game of like, Oh, you, you accidentally shot a pedestrian or, you know, you shot the super galactic <laughs> criminal. Like it, it's got that frantic, pace to it like it's just a real it's like a fun party game uh on top of being like a fun kind of just like chasing the leaderboard uh you know it's it's just there's nothing really quite like it it's it's definitely like it's a simple concept but it's really addictive and fun to play thanks yeah i i i hope that would be the case and it, it seems well, to that's have, that's seems with to all your out. games as yeah with all your games i mean they're just unbelievably replayable and again he, he, so even the first three that are more arcadey are super replayable just in their nature but again with dungeon death ball even i haven't beaten it yet unlike dj but like i still keep chipping away at like i want i want to keep playing it and i want like it, it's just a really fun set of mechanics like i really like <laughs> how I, I kind of again having not really looked into it too much be, knowing it was in early access like I just knew like oh this looks cool it's a new game from Matt I'll check it out when it's out um I was kind of just under the assumption oh it's a tactical dodgeball game and like that's kind of all I thought it was and it's like no this is like combining elements of like football and uh hey, there's just so there's so much more to it you're not actually like in a lot of cases you're not trying to even hit the enemies with the ball you're trying to actually just carry the ball to the end zone and it's not like the field isn't divided in half like i was expecting like my team on one side the other team on the other side it's like no you have obstacles and you're actually like the play field will shrink if you take too long and like (laughs) it's just it's so well balanced i i really love it and it never feels too challenging but it doesn't feel like it's it doesn't feel like it's too easy but how have you enjoyed or or not enjoyed the early access experience like getting feedback from players i know you have your own discord as well like where people pop into there and your Patreon, like, have you found that to be a rewarding or, or useful process or frustrating at times or mixed bag? Um, it, yeah, it can be a bit of both. Um, like for the most part, I'm, I, I love it. Like when I get feedback and I, I find it so useful and I'm, and I'm always grateful. Um, and it, like, it just, it continues to, I guess, like just amaze me that, you know, people, sink so much time into something that I've made and, and get so much enjoyment out of it. And it's like to usually you don't get that until the, the game's released. Um, but to be able to have that kind of drip fed through the development process as well has been really, really cool. Um, and to be able to use that to guide my decision-making has been really cool as well, especially as this is a a genre, which I've never worked in before, like the turn-based tactics. Um, so yeah, it was absolutely invaluable. Um, like the the side of it that I find frustrating is, um, it's mainly that like I can't do everything. You know, like I, I get great feedback all the time, um, and it's almost always valid to some extent. Yeah. Um, but but it often there's like in the back of my mind it's like okay that's a really (laughs) that's a really good idea and the game would definitely benefit from that but like i just don't have time like or or it's like there's such a huge cost involved in implementing that like whether it's kind of you know all the rebalancing that comes as a fallout of that or or like you know all the other systems that it would interfere with in some way that would just be a big kind of unknowable mess uh, of of issues to resolve afterwards um yeah i just find like oh how do i how do i deal with that like how do i kind of let people down gently and tell them like i love your idea but i, I just can't do it and right right yeah that that's been like one of the hardest parts actually um well i say one of the hardest parts but maybe not one of the hardest parts but a hard part <laughs> Yeah, no, but I, I know what you mean. I, I can only imagine. But at the same time, maybe some of those ideas, even if they don't and end up making their way into Dungeon Death Ball, it might be something that you're like, oh, that you, that you tuck away for later. Like, hey, that's a cool idea that like I wish I would have thought of that earlier. And if I now that I have it in my bag of tricks, like I can maybe implement a similar concept into a, another project. And, yeah implemented it, you know, in an interesting way where it's in this way, you'd be kind of wedging it into something that's already working you know it's not broken yeah by any yeah. means you know so 
yeah you definitely get like these um you, you start to notice patterns of like things people ask for or want or you know like what would like to change and that's been really helpful uh, and, and like this is applying to you know reviews of finished games as, as much as early access as well you start to notice yeah. people kind of ask for similar kinds of things and like with my games i found really in like in, in a big way with my first three arcade games is like people wanted more you know like they're, they're small games yeah they're quite constrained in their scope and people have always just asked for like even if it's not like a bigger game as such or like a longer experience but you know more modes or like unlockable stuff or you know some some ways to kind of vary it and mix it up so yeah that's something that i've really tried to address i got a, a bit of that into um singled out like i put in the memory mode where you you can't see the hints after a few seconds. Um, yeah. And then in Dungeon Death Ball, I tried to put a little bit more of that, well, a lot more of that kind of stuff in as well, because it's like, yeah, you're, you're totally right. You know, like, why not kind of, once you've made like a full game, it's it's usually not too much of a, a an ask to kind of add some like variation on that. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, like putting in, 20 new levels for like you know a first person shooter or something that's like a that's a huge right, ask but right. like you know a mode that just like changes the rules a little bit is it's much more feasible a little and, more feasible yeah 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 so like if i can kind of bear that stuff in mind going into it then that's really really beneficial yeah now do you have any like when it comes to influences in particular for like dungeon death ball do you have any like influences like ta- tactics wise that you're kind of looking at like I know in the discord like it seems like into the breach comes up pretty often yeah um as far as like I think to me it seems like it comes up in the sense that it's just like it's a very readable game like it's like you kind of know what the enemies are going to do and then you can plan out your moves and it's very it, it's chess like in that way like you're even you have more like more knowledge than you would have in chess like you actually know what the team is going to do next so like you can kind of it's just really well thought out in that regard yeah yeah the into the breach was was i'd say like the the one biggest influence on dungeon death ball for sure um that game really kind of like i guess like opened my eyes to a a totally different way of designing tactics games really not that it's a good game it's a really good game it's really good yeah um yeah and yeah, like you said, like the, the kind of perfect information aspect of it was something that was really, really helpful to to look at as a point of reference um, throughout all of development, start to finish, um, because like the, uh, they really nailed it in many, many ways. Um, and as I understand, uh, the developers of Into the Breach, you know, went through many, many iterations and had to figure this stuff out and to be able to look to that for a like a yeah, point of reference to learn from has been invaluable and um and really awesome so yeah thanks thanks to those guys for <laughs> doing all the work for me <laughs> doing the research <laughs> yeah. but um yeah but the other like the other aspect of it which i really um was inspired by was like just how uh how kind of short and compact the battles were in that game um yeah where it's something like you know well, almost every other tactics game really is like long drawn out battles that can take. Yeah, you, you hear know, tactics and you think like XCOM and like let's yeah. we're sitting down and playing this all day on on permadeath mode and you know it's like it's an extreme form of gaming a lot of times. Yeah, and yeah, like a big commitment, right? And yeah, we're yeah. into the breach. You can just dip in. Uh, like sometimes they can take a long time, but like usually that's just because you're agonizing over one decision. And, yeah, and you know, if decision. you wanted to be quicker, you could. Um, yeah. But like, what is it like four four turns is generally the turn limit and in into the breach. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I I just thought that was great. Like everything's just so condensed and like the the maps are really small. Like they all fit on one screen. Um, yeah. You have just three units to to take care of um yeah I, I really like that aspect and that was something i wanted to put in dungeon death ball as well so that's like that's why that has that same kind of same kind of format yeah. really like short small constrained battles with not many units to keep track of yeah and i, I would say you've potentially even condensed that format like down even tighter like in the like it just feels like 
it, it still has the arcadey feel that your other games have like this, especially, you know, it might be, you know, the chunky pixels and the and the awesome chip tunes are definitely helping the cause. But like it just has that like immediacy of like, I, I still feel like I'm playing a Matt Glanville game. I don't <laughs> it's not like I'm just totally switching gears and playing a tactics game. So like, do you have on the arcadey end of things, like are there strong influences or even inspirations from like growing up and like, Oh, these are the things that like really got me. Like the, these are the things I look to recreate in my games or the, like the feeling I look to recreate. Um, one of the big ones for dungeon death ball was, uh, like my biggest touchstone for tactics games, which was Vandal hearts. Do you know Vandal Hearts? Okay. I, I'm a familiar with the name. Is it a PlayStation game, I want to say? Yeah, PS1. The first two games yeah, were yeah. PS1. Um, the first one in particular had just like such a cool style. Like it was really, really pixely, low poly, crunchy, colorful, um, like chunky little dioramas, you know. Um, yeah. Very much in like the Final Fantasy Tactics ballpark but okay like but more pixely like it wasn't trying to kind of smooth over it too much yeah um, like final fantasy tries to go for like that painterly look yeah. sometimes where like yeah I, I know what you mean where it's like yeah this is more chunky and pixely yeah and vandal hearts 2 kind of steered more in that direction but the first one was like just really nice and crunchy and and it had these amazing like it's really gory but like these amazing blood geezers or geysers that like when you kill an enemy, it just erupts into the air. Like, you know, the kind of like Shogun assassin, like just way yeah, over yeah, the top, yeah. like fountains of blood spurt out. And it was so yeah. satisfying to, to do like to kill an, any enemy in that game. Well, like if they yeah. were like made of rock, it would just be like boulders just pouring out of them everywhere. Um, so that kind and of it goes stuff a long is, way in a tactics game, like where you don't get to actually like input your attacks per se or yeah. like execute them in a in a dynamic way. Like it, it goes a long way to have a cool animation that goes along with it and just like makes you feel awesome when you're doing it. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. So that was one that was one big one. And then throughout the rest of my games, like it's not something that I'm even particularly conscious of anymore. But the Vlambia games, I think, had a, a big impact. And like I'm sure lots of other people would say the same. but um yeah yeah like just looking at how much kind of polish and juice goes into those into those games like it just kind of changed my way of like thinking about like how to how to add like visual feedback and audio feedback to my games um up until i really looked at their games in in depth it was i think like if you went back and looked at any of the any of the stuff i made before then it's just kind of like piddly and um like not very impactful and like stuff is generally just very substantial maybe yeah yeah Yeah. and it's like really you want to make that stuff noticeable you want to make it really pop Um, yeah because again with something like switch and shoot where it's literally a one button shooter like you're not even controlling the steering of your ship like you, you just switch directions every time you shoot hence the name but like that that's got to feel good you know you yeah. gotta every time you push that button it's got to feel satisfying or when you go into the um like when you're fully charged up i forget what you go through like the hyper zone hyperdrive and like it yeah. hyperdrive yeah and it's like you, you know you got that heavy laser beam and you feel kind of out of control and it's just like the way the screen starts rumbling like <laughs> you know you almost feel you're not you know it's i'm being extreme but like you almost feel like you're in the cockpit you know like of the ship and it's rumbling and like you need that stuff because otherwise if it was just like that easily could have also in prototype form just been like a little basic looking triangle ship with, you know, it could just be really boring at a, at a glance. But like all that extra juice, even all the character names, like every time your character spawns and I'm sure you just I don't know if those are randomly generated or if you just plugged in a million names and had them pop up. But I, I think they're all <laughs> hilarious. Like I love or even like just the little expressions when you die and like your commander has like the exp- I just uh, yeah, your the humor in your games is so great. Like. Um, so I'm such a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those names are randomly generated. Well, it's actually a combination. Like there's there's like a few hundred um, parts of names, and then I stitch them together. So there's like there's like a bunch of um, beginnings, there's a bunch of middles, and there's a bunch of ends, and then I like grab one of each and put them in a row. Okay, and that makes nice. a name. And then That's I awesome. also have to like run them through a filter just to make sure it didn't accidentally spell out something obscene. <laughs> which happened loads <laughs> more that's than awesome. you think that's hilarious <laughs> that's pretty hilarious yeah um 
Now, I know like you mentioned uh, that you're now kind of doing the solo indie dev thing and you've been doing that for a while, but uh, you were previously working in the game industry itself, right? Yep. Yep. How, how Now, how do you feel? How do you like between I'm sure there's pros and cons to each, but like being full time solo indie dev, like, do you feel like that was the right move to make? Do you feel like I, I'm really happy in this setting to kind of do my own thing and not have you know, in any job, like it's t- that's the hardest part, at least for me, is like, you know, there, there's sometimes you're just like, but it doesn't make sense to do it that way. But you have to do it that way because that's just the way that you do it at your job. You know, yeah. but when you're your own boss, it's like, hey, I want to make the game this way. I don't care what anybody else thinks. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, how, do, do you feel like that's the case or do you miss being part of a bigger team sometimes or? Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. Again, like it's like some for the most part i'm i'm happy uh that that i took the plunge and and i i definitely think like at the time it was the right decision to make and um yeah it was um it was what i needed at the time and yeah for sure and and i'm really happy with like everything that i've managed to do in that time as well um yeah. there's definitely times when i i do miss the like the collaborative aspect of it um but then you know there was there's times where i just I don't even think about that because I'm just so happy just kind of, you know, getting on with my own thing. Um, yeah. I love to just kind of like get lost in the zone and, and just make stuff like make, you know, make whatever I want to make. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. The, like the, the biggest thing I think is, well, the, I guess the two biggest thing one, one of them is obviously like the kind of financial stability you get from having a job like that is just kind of right just so um so kind of tough to deal with on an ongoing basis like to not have that you know Um, yeah yeah and and i wouldn't say you know i've really struggled financially um which i'm which i'm thankful for but um but just knowing all the time in the back of your mind that that you don't know if like the next thing you make is gonna it's going to sell or not. And you don't know what that's going to mean for you in a few months time or, or whatever. Right. Um, right. And especially when you're in a situation, like it's not just you living in an apartment by yourself. It's like, I've got a wife and I've got a two and a half year old kid. Like exactly. It's, you know, I've, I've got people that are depending on me, you know, I've, especially when I know my dad always says like, when you were born, I'm the oldest in my family. He's like, when you were born, like, that's when I realized like, Hey, I can't mess around anymore. Like, yeah. <laughs> I gotta like get my shit together and, and make sure that I'm, you know, making a living and whatever, you know, exactly. So it's like yeah. You, you can't like just be winging it and like, Oh, if this doesn't work out, I'll, I'll figure something else out, you know? Yeah. 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 So there's that, it's just kind of like constantly gnawing away at the back of your mind. Um, and then, and then the other thing is just, yeah, like the collaborative side of it, you know, um, having just being able to like throw an idea at someone and be like, what do you think of this? Like, what, what should we or like yeah. or, or like you know just kind of offloading something like what should we do like i don't know what to do with this what should i do yeah <laughs> you know? or, yeah even maybe taking <laughs> taking someone else's idea and running with it and like yeah. you know so it's, sometimes you can be inspired like it just takes a little spark from somebody else and then like oh that's a great idea like what if we did it like this you know and then all of a sudden you got a whole new concept or something you know yeah so yeah. and and i would imagine the scope as well like you know because you i know you had worked on some of like the odd world games in the past yeah. and like you know those are much much larger games that on a scale than what you're working on. Like, do you miss that kind of aspect of like level design and stuff like that? Cause I, again, you're, you're doing more stuff that's on like the procedural generation or random generation sort of thing. Like you're balancing difficulty more than designing levels. If that makes sense. I hope yeah. I'm not speaking out of turn there, but no, no, that's absolutely um, it. Like, do you miss that aspect of things like designing levels or did you do stuff like that before? Sometimes, yeah, yeah, I was doing a lot of that stuff. I did, um, I did that on Oddworld New and Tasty. I was like, I mean, nice. that was that was a remake, so it was it was kind of constrained in how much I could, uh, you know, create new levels, change things, change and, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I was doing level design on Oddworld Soulstorm as well um, during nice. the early stages of that project, um, and that was really like, yeah, kind of, you know, we can kind of really run with that and come up with completely new like wild ideas and and that kind of stuff and yeah that is always fun for sure like i i i kind of got my start in doing stuff like that like doing level design with um like half-life mods and starcraft level editor and that nice. kind of stuff 
Um, nice. And I'm I'm a huge fan of kind of imagining up like uh, imagining environments and worlds to explore and kind of ex- you know like lots of set pieces um, and like atmospheres and moods and all that sort of stuff. Like I, I, yeah, I really love working on that kind of thing too. So um, yeah, sometimes I miss it, but like. I, it's a totally different um, skill set, and I think sometimes that it's not really one that's compatible with the work I'm doing now because it just takes yeah. so long to make anything, unless you really kind of like constrain the fidelity of it um, right. and go for something very, very simple. Um, you, you just can't really like as a solo developer, you can't really make a, a, the kind of stuff that I would want to make anyway. Um, is yeah. like the levels for that as well as the game itself you know like that's just right right just so much work um but like you know if it was if i was in a team or if i was yeah working on a bigger project like that kind of stuff is it's really really fun to do yeah now what about uh like future future wise as far as like what you plan on doing next like i know you're still kind of working on dungeon death ball and and honing in but do you have other things like p- down the pipeline that you're planning on or are you just kind of like hey i'm just work focus on dungeon death ball right now or if you can talk about any of that i don't know if you got things up your sleeve as well yeah to be honest it's really just like really focus on dungeon death ball right now um nice yeah it's it's kind of just go all out get it done figure out what's next um yeah i I really don't know at this point i always have um, tons of ideas and tons of prototypes or like you know just little um mock-ups of stuff that i just like I was saying earlier, just like making a day or whatever. And that kind of stuff tends to, I mean, lately, like that kind of stuff, I was really just had to shelve. Um, but, yeah. but there, there is a lot of things that I could draw on if I was going to, but right. It's yeah. always like cooking and simmering in the back of your brain somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, no idea right now. <laughs> That's not even yeah. just trying to dodge the question, <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. That That's like, has me excited in a different way. Like I'd obviously be excited if you knew what you were working on, but I'm also excited to just, again, like you've got such a great track record of making cool stuff. That's up my alley that it's just like, I see your little egg logo that I used to think was a potato. And I'm just like, you know, I'm like that. And all I need to see is that. And I'm, I'm good to go. Um, I did want to ask a, a little bit too. I know that like a lot of people, uh, indie developers will mention like how tough it is to like get their games on different platforms or even get a publisher and whatnot. And I know that you self publish all your games, um, or for the most part, I know you have had some help publishing on, uh, like PlayStation and whatnot, but I think you've self published on switch. Um, and I think you're on steam as well, right? Self published. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I worked with, um, Huey games who did the publishing for, um, switch and shoot on PlayStation four and Xbox one. Okay. Um, and then nice. everything else has been self-published. Yeah. Nice. And how did, how have you enjoyed that experience? Like, has that been, have you ever worked with a publisher before other than Huey games? Like it, even when you were at like your previous jobs, like, you um, know, do, do you feel like it's just, is that just another element of like, I'm just flying solo and this is awesome. Or is it another layer of stress of like, man, I got to figure out the business end of this and yeah, so on and so forth. It's mostly stress. If I'm honest, like it's, it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I love making games and I don't necessarily like a lot of people probably say the same, but I don't necessarily yeah. love selling games or marketing games right. or going through like the, the digital storefront um paperwork or all that kind of stuff it's yeah that seems to be the general conundrum is like i you know the people that making the games like they spend so much time it's like then you got to put just as much effort and energy into like engaging on social media or doing whatever if you really want to try to get the word out there and it's like you but you want to you feel like you've earned this break like i just finished a game i just made a game like yeah or i just finished the demo or i you know whatever you whatever aspect of it you just finished you're like i don't want to now record 25 gifts and have tweets scheduled all week like it's a, it's a lot you know yeah so i i definitely can see like you're like but at the same time you're like if nobody buys my game especially in your case where you're like i'm a solo dev self-publishing games like i i'm making a living on people buying this game or not you know so it's like that double-edged sword of like you kind of got to do it but you don't necessarily want to or, or enjoy it or whatever you know yeah so like in that respect like working with a publisher can really help um, or having, yeah. you know, someone that can do that for you, 
on the like PR marketing side of things. So, you know, maybe you can post to your social media accounts and all that kind of stuff. But I do like to do things on my own. So I, I really kind of limit what I can do in that way. But I think, I think I'm kind of overall happier doing it that way. Um, yeah, you always know what's going on. I'm, I'm very similar in that regard too. It's like, I'd like to just, I want to know, I want to know what's going to happen from start to finish. And the only way that I can do that is by being there for all of it. You know, I can't like just pay half attention, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know, like uh, any, any other, like just before we wrap things up, like any huge influences or just things you want to mention that maybe just wouldn't come up within the realm of conversation, like any just games you grew up, like this is the game that kind of got me started on games in general, like really what, you know, that made you want to become a game designer or, you know, just, just, you know, inspired you to be like, this is what I want to do, you know, cause it's not, I, I, like you said, it's not easy to do. And it definitely is one of those things that like you have to be passionate about it to, yeah, yeah. to do well, just period. I mean, unless you get lucky and have a, a release like Celeste that like, you know, is made by a handful of people that sells millions and millions of copies and you're, you know, get it just have such success with that. Like, unless it's a story like that or super meat boy, like you're really, you're struggling. It's like the struggling artist kind of situation, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's not easy to be due. So you really have to love it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you, it- like we were saying earlier, um, my my biggest influence and like my biggest inspiration is always Half Life Two, and and like yeah, okay, you've done yeah. it, you've you've got me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I had it written down here. So it's got to it's come up. <laughs> like anyone who knows me just is sick of hearing about it because I talk about it all the time. But I, I actually went on like a bit of a a bit of a binge recently where I kind of revisited a bunch of Half-Life 2, um, like, mods and, like, videos of, like, you know, old levels that I used to play and, like, pick through some of the level files in the level editor because, wow, I just, yeah. I just love it so much. I love, like, I love that world and I love um, the attention to to detail in, in all the levels. And one of the things that I don't think really um, occurred to me at the time, but, like, the more I... Um, the more like my kind of development style has evolved, the more I've realized like that game actually, I don't think it gets enough credit for like the kind of breadth of um, how much kind of emergent gameplay can come out of the encounters in that game, like the combat encounters. Um, And that's something I'm really trying to like, well, I'm looking at now and just like continually continuously being like finding new sources of inspiration from it uh, like back in the day i used to really love like the the environment design and like the kind of the world of it and how like they would lead you down this like very authored path you know like they, they yeah, get you yeah. to go from a to b and you feel like you went there like you feel like you chose that path yourself actually you're being led every step of the way like Right, exactly you're where they literally you walking down a corridor. Yeah, yeah, but like the more I've kind of looked at it recently, it's like actually they they really let you have actually quite a high amount of agency within that scope. So like, okay, it's yeah. like a linear A to B kind of game, but when you compare it to, <clears throat> I know it gets like a lot of stick, but um, you know some of the sort of um, later Call of Duty games where it like they yeah. kind of got. Um, criticized for being very, very constrained and like you had to basically do exactly the same thing as every other player in exactly the same order. Like I think when you compare something like that to Half-Life 2, um, Half-Life 2 was just like way ahead of that. Um, And you can like pick up a totally different weapon to someone else and you can approach combat encounters in a completely different way if you, you know, use the environment in a different way or um use like the like exploit the enemy's ai in a different way or um use like the physics engine in a different way um there's so much that you can do there and there's so many little moments of like kind of putting your own stamp on things and putting your own style on things as a player which I, i really think it kind of didn't didn't and doesn't get enough credit for 
Um, yeah, I feel but, like you hear that like the first time, not the first time I heard it, but like between like System Shock and Bioshock, like you always hear about like that kind of emergent gameplay, like, oh, mm-hmm. you can, you know, lure the lure them into the water and then zap the electricity. But yeah, you could do that type of stuff, not necessarily in the, the that exact combination, but like, yeah, you could do stuff with the environment and like it kind of cheesing the systems a little bit and like, you know, you could, you could do cool stuff. I haven't played a ton of half-life and of any variety. I've only played a little bit of half-life two on, I had the orange box on uh PS three okay. and I played a little bit of it, but just never, never, I'm not much of an FPS person. So I, I was just like, I got to check this out. I feel like I need to know what it is, but I haven't, haven't, I, I, I guess I need to play it basically. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, of course I'm going to say themselves yeah. a gamer. Yeah. yeah anyone <laughs> that calls themselves a gamer has to play a half life. And now have you played, uh, not to get sidetracked, but have you played half life Alex at all in the VR one? Yeah, I, I had to, I had to. <laughs> yeah, okay. You, you, you've got a VR set up and everything. Uh, yeah. I got, a, I got an Oculus quest purely so that I could okay. play half life Alex. Cause it was like, it was the cheapest option. Um, not the best option, yeah. but, um, but it was the cheapest at the time. Um, yeah, I played through all of that. Like, it, I I really enjoyed it. But the actual like experience of doing that was really cumbersome and not one that I want to go back and play again in a hurry. Because I had to. Right, like, right. I have my so like currently where I'm recording now. I'm in like my kind of office slash spare bedroom, and then um, yeah. my son's bedroom is right next door. And then uh, we're we are in like quite a tall, thin house, so there's like rooms on each, yeah. like, across like four floors. Um, okay. So I didn't really want to be up here because I'd be making a lot of noise, and I didn't want to wake him up. Um, so I took my entire PC downstairs into the living room um, and hooked up my Oculus Quest to that. Um, so I had a lot more, yeah. m- lot more space there, but then, you know, like every, the next day I had to bring it back upstairs to carry on working again. So, right. Right. And you know, the game took, I don't know, like a week or something to, to finish. So like, yeah, every day for a week, like taking my PC up and down two or three flights yeah. of stairs every night, like. It was just a hassle. I didn't really enjoy it. Yeah, there's that. still there's still not a great optimal VR setup. Like I'd love to have one, but at the same time I'm not rushing out to buy one because I don't have a great place to play it currently, you know? Yeah. So the quest is good, I will say that. Like the, the wireless VR was a huge, huge improvement. Um Oh, I didn't I didn't know it was wireless. That's awesome. Yeah, you can play it like on its own as just a freestanding um uh device, you know, like you don't need a PC to, to run anything. Oh, cool. Um, it just all cool. runs on the headset, but um, you can't play Alex that way, Half Life Alex that right, way. So, right. you so then, a little more juice. Yeah, yeah. So you have to yeah. hook it up to a PC to do that, um, and and then you can do uh, like you can wirelessly stream it. So it's actually like just streaming a video to your headset. Um, oh, so cool. it's still wireless, but then you're going to run out of battery eventually. So you need to right, like, either right. stop playing or you need to plug in a cable for a while be tethered or whatever yeah 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 so apart from all those things it was great <laughs> yeah so uh so can we expect the next uh crowbar sky game to be uh to be a vr <laughs> no <laughs> i would you know a dungeon death ball would be pretty cool in vr i gotta say even when like the door opens up and you get kind of yeah. into the arena that would be pretty cool yeah i considered um, it but, i started like, thinking about like could i put all of my games into vr and I thought like singled out would be pretty cool because you could just have like all of these oh, heads yeah. like, floating around and you just point and shoot. Yeah. Um, and like maybe you've got like a clipboard with your like the the, the hints on it, you know? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. that's the best match. Um, I thought the switch and shoot could be quite cool if it was like as a, a virtual arcade cabinet. So you just like stood at an arcade cabinet. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of those I've like when I played the uh, I've only tried VR one time, but when I tried the super hot demo uh, or not demo, just super hot, the first VR version of it or whatever, like you, they start you off in kind of like a little office room space or whatever. And you re- I really felt like I was like, man, I'm I'm here. Like, yeah. this feels pretty real. It's, it's not convincing, it didn't yeah. feel like I'm in a V like I'm in a virtual thing. I was like, I'm I'm in this space like it feels tangible to me. And it's really impressive. Um, yeah. So it yeah, is. that that seems like it would be cool. Yeah, and actually, that was one of the things I really liked about Half Life Alex was like the this the world of Half Life that I've kind of you know known for so long. 
It's like actually yeah. kind of stepping into it and seeing yeah. it for real. It's like, oh, this is a real place. Is you like kind of you know watching watching a movie and then actually going to where it was filmed or something like that. Is that kind of thing? Yeah, seeing like the true scale of things. Like, oh, that's how big that enemy is, or that's yeah. how you know, like it's not just seeing it one step removed. You're like you're within. It's pretty cool. It's I'm. I'm definitely looking forward to like VR being a more affordable, more convenient option somewhere down the line, because I think that could be a really fun experience, you know? Yeah, I think it's coming like it's just a matter of time, really. It's a shame that it has to be like all kind of driven by Facebook uh, that they've got their kind of hooks in so much of the the most affordable hardware right now. Yeah. yeah, but hopefully that you know that just means they're going to drive other other companies to competition and yeah 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 so hopefully soon <laughs> yeah well cool uh, so I'll start to get us sidetracked on a VR <laughs> half yeah. conversation there at the end but uh, me. but I don't know is there uh, is there anything uh, else you want to chat about before we wrap things up or uh, pretty good to call it there yeah I'm happy to call it there. Perfect. Perfect. But uh, yeah, where can uh, people find you on the Internet, Matt, as far as uh, your games? And we'll have links in the episode description, of course, too. But where can people uh, find you and chat with you? Yeah, you can find all of my stuff at mattglanville.com, all one word. And my Twitter and most of my other online social media stuff is at Crowbar Scar, S-K-A. Like the kind of music like we discussed last week. Awesome. But the good (laughs) classic kind. The classic kind, yeah. And well, again, we'll put links to all that stuff. I'll try to remember to put links to like your Patreon and Itch.io page, Steam page, all that stuff, so people can quickly find you know all the games and whatnot because they're all the games except for Dungeon Death Ball are out on Switch for five bucks. Like, cannot recommend them enough. Uh, which we've already done multiple times on the podcast. We're not just saying it because Matt's here, um, <laughs> but it's and Dungeon Death Ball is right right up there with it. Uh, I think it will be maybe a little more than five bucks as it should be um cuz it's got a it's ton of replayability um again it's available early access on Steam right now so check it out uh but if you want to wait like I usually do for the 1.0 I think it should be coming relatively soon ish very soon yeah very soon okay it's really close yeah. now i've been saying that yeah, for like it, 2 years but it genuinely is very 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 close and it's really like it feels like a complete game as i'm playing it i'm definitely not thinking like oh there's you know, there's things missing here. Like you've been adding things and it's like, oh, nice. That's a cool feature. Oh, this is nice. Or that nice touch. But like it it wouldn't feel incomplete without that. Like it's just like, oh, that's a nice little polish layer, you know? Yeah. So yeah, this game is definitely one to keep your eye on, whether you've been a fan of Matt's previous work or not Um, into the breach. If you were into something like that and looking for something a little different, definitely check out Dungeon Death Ball. But I'm rambling at this point. Uh, We can uh, probably uh, wrap things up there and uh, we will uh, catch you next week. Thanks again for uh, joining us for a couple of episodes here, Matt. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all the tireless work that you do to to promote smaller indie games. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure all the developers of all the games that you talk about appreciate it, too. Thanks, man. I I, ho- I I was gonna say I hope they do, but e- either way, I'm I would do it one way or the other because I just think the games are so fun. I'm like, even if these developers hate me and hate <laughs> all the tags on Twitter from time to time, it's like you know I just love these games and I want more people to play them. And I know that's like we had, that was one thing I wanted to maybe even dig in with you on. Like I, I didn't even bring it up, but like how hard it is to like get your game seen in the indie world or even just video game world in general. But there's just so many games, it's hard to make your game stand out and make people. Well, pay attention to it again, unless you get that Celeste that just captures everyone's attention at all at once. You know, you, you that, those are very few and far between. There's only a couple of those that come out a year, if that. Yeah. So that that's uh, that's got to be that's a whole nother animal. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope Dungeon Death Ball cracks through and, and really makes a little splash because it, it should. It's I think it speaks to a lot of people's gameplay wants and yeah. desires, I guess. Here's but, hoping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm rambling again. But uh but yeah, take care everybody and we'll catch you next week. Bye. That looks right now, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Should we do a clap again? Or... Yeah, we'll do another clap, and I've I've got the backup just in case, like okay. on the Skype recording. So if, if something screwed up, I, I definitely have audio to work with. So Okay. All right. Here All right. we go. One, two, three.
Yeah, that was spot on that one. Oh, that was perfect. You're get you're getting it down. <laughs> man. You're gonna you're gonna have to be a regular member on the podcast <laughs> soon. It's funny how my like at first it was definitely like a thing where we'd be like, well, let me try that again. Now it's just like, let's go one, two, three, boom. Nice. boom. <laughs> yeah. we all, we're all pretty much on the spot. <laughs> so like John and I, I can expect it. We play in a band together. So if we can't if we can't be in sync, that's a problem. Yeah. But 